a reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And look, there was a great earthquake, for a messenger of God, descending from heaven, came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Its appearance was like lightning, and its clothing white as snow. For fear of the messenger, the guards shook and were as though dead. But the messenger responded to the women and said, Fear not, I know that you all are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here, for he's been raised, just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples. He's been raised from the dead, and see, he's on to Galilee ahead of you. There you all will see him. This is my message for you. So the women left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples the news. Then all of a sudden, Jesus met them and said, Shalom. They came to him, took hold of his feet, and bowed down, worshiping him. Then Jesus said to them, Fear not. Go and tell my sisters and brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Uh, I had a, a meeting with my friend and mentor Elaine Heath this week. Uh, Elaine lives on a 30-acre farm with her husband in North Carolina, and it's called Spring Forest. And their farming work involves and benefits refugee families and um, other asylees in the area. And they have a number of different initiatives that go on on this farm that help their surrounding community learn about eco-spirituality, as she calls it, the presence of God in nature. At the center of their work is a spiritual community, a church that prays and works and eats together. I asked Elaine what their plans were for Easter, and she said they'd be having a sunrise service outside on the part of their land where they could see the sun as it rises through the trees. It'll be 38 degrees, so we'll have a campfire going and warm beverages, she said. We'll keep the silence until the sun rises, and then our worship leader will lead us in songs of celebration as the dawn breaks through the forest. And then she said, after we have some readings and prayer, it'll be really simple. We'll send people out into the forest to look for the way resurrection is revealed in the earth. And then we'll have breakfast together. My response was, I'll see you Sunday. Because that sounds amazing, doesn't it? Now, I'm really sorry, guys. Uh, we'll work next year to get secure a 30-acre farm uh, with a customized sunrise and a um, scavenger resurrection hunt, for sure. Right, yeah, yeah. For you, Sarah, we'll dial it back. How about 9.30? Does that, does that work? Yeah, great. Looking for the ways resurrection is revealed in the earth. I love that. It really resonated with me, I think, because sometimes because I'm so far removed from this story that we just read about Jesus's resurrection, because it happened so long ago, uh, sometimes I wonder, is it really true? Did it really happen? Was Jesus really raised from the dead? Is resurrection really a thing? I believe it. I confess it with faith, even though I don't understand it sometimes. But sometimes I want to feel that it's true, you know? And it's hard to feel that it's true in a world that's riddled with death and violence. It's hard to feel that it's true when my own heart is riddled with death and violence. But what if, as Elaine suggests, there is evidence of resurrection all around us, wired 
into even the natural order of things? What if we could tangibly see and feel and touch resurrection the way the Marys did in the garden when they saw Jesus after his crucifixion and death? I wonder what the folks at Spring Forest found in the forest this morning as they went looking for resurrection. Maybe new leaves budding on the trees, flowers emerging from the loblolly pines, St. Augustine grass sprouting up and spreading across the ground, butterflies that had exited their cocoons and taken flight. Yesterday, I took a walk in my neighborhood and I noticed one of my favorite things about the newness of spring, the color, the color of the leaves on the trees. Green is not an adequate word to describe what color it is. It's almost neon, bright, radiant, verdant green in the new leaves of the trees. And right alongside it were reminders of the death of winter in the trees that had not yet fully bloomed. They were a mix of dead brown leaves and the beginning sprouts of new ones. Death and resurrection is wired into the cycle of the seasons. Several of us have been reading Richard Rohr's Falling Upward together this spring. He is a, a Franciscan priest and a spiritual ninja. That's my description of him. Uh, this past week, we discussed one of the ways he describes the spiritual journey with the metaphor of home. The spiritual journey, Rohr says, is both a journey from home and toward home. Now, I know the idea of home is a mixed bag for many of us. Rohr says our truest and first home is radical connection and union with God. Home is life and resurrection. We are born out of radical union with God. And through our lives and death, we return to radical union with God. Home is the bookends of our finite mortal experience. It's not two separate things, but a single reality. Life and resurrection surrounds our entire existence. We come from it and we return to it. And in between leaving home and returning home, we find ourselves looking for home, longing for it, wanting to feel it. We experience homesickness. Rohr says that most would probably describe this homesickness as loneliness or isolation, longing, sadness, restlessness, or even a kind of depression. What if my desire to feel like resurrection is true even amid the death and violence in the world and in myself, what if that desire is an expression of homesickness? In the midst of this homesickness, we have this homing device within us, also known as the Holy Spirit, that draws us forward toward home. Rohr says, home is another word for the spirit that we are, our true self in God. And that self-same moment that we find ourselves in God, we also find ourselves, the, the moment that we find God in ourselves, we also find ourselves inside God. And this is the full homecoming. What if it's true? What if our existence, riddled with death and violence and homesickness as it is, what if our existence is enveloped? by life from beginning to end? What if our journey from home to home, from life to life, is at the same time riddled with life and resurrection? If only we have eyes to see it. Elaine's resurrection scavenger hunt got me thinking, where do I see resurrection right now? I was driving south on Coit, headed toward my Northway office, one morning this week, passing the big Costco warehouse on my left, trying not to think about what I needed to purchase there. But thinking about this question, where do I see resurrection life right now? When it hit me like a ton of bricks. 
It's you. I see the resurrection in you, in this spiritual community. I see new life on the other side of great loss and grief. I see new leaves of faith, even as the old ones die and fall off as a matter of course. I see joy and resilience and courage in you. I see love and justice and kindness. I see deep belonging and inclusion and hospitality. I see the resurrection in you all. You are embodied witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Made me cry, guys. I'm curious, as you think about that question for yourself, where do you see resurrection right now? And as is our custom, we have a little microphone somewhere. I think it's in front of Ben. Um, <laughs> yep. Uh, if, if you want to share, there's space for you to share. We, For the sake of our friends virtually, for John, um, we pass the mic so that he can hear us. So where do you see resurrection right now? You want me to run it? Okay. Uh huh. I think you have to push the button. Oh, there's a little button on the bottom. You got to click. Oh, real quick. Okay. Ooh. Hello, magical. Um. So you kind of touched on this in the forest examples, but I um what a year or two ago planted some peonies in my garden um, on like, I just was like, I'm gonna try to plant something and grow it. Um, put these um, put these plants into the ground um, and then they died like last year. Um, one of them had like a fungus. I was a little sad about that, um, but they grew again that second year um, and then they died. Um, and my friend had told me um, that every year they're supposed to like duplicate. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I don't know about that. I do nothing to care for these plants. Like <laughs> I, I leave them like even like the places that had died were still like present when I went to check on them, uh, these like old, you know, like anyway, the remnants, um, were there. Yes. Thank you. Um, but I went to check on them. Um, and I do, um, with this kind of excitement now. Um, and so this year, um, went out and, and saw the broken places, but did, I saw that they were doubling. Um, and so in each of the three places I'd planted, um, they again, just came up again, without any effort, uh, from me, I, I really, I really did nothing. Um, <laughs> I want to make that clear. You can't emphasize how <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, not only did they like, you know, resurrect, but they like duplicated their, their power. Mm. Um, and I thought that was really beautiful. That's delightful. Thank you. Um. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I see resurrection in the little girls that I take care of during the week. Um, you know, as my kids have gotten older and I've gotten older, you know, I just, I lose the eyes of awareness and newness, you know, and they, you know, or experiencing things for the first time or just, you know, like displaying like such joy and happiness in all of these small little things and small little experiences. Um, mm. That feels like resurrection. Yeah. Lovely.
So um, for those that have been with us in the, the falling upward um, study, this is, is reminiscent. There's, there's something uh, that, that Richard Rohr says in one of the early chapters that, that I remarked on and we talked about, which is he says something to the effect of each generation in some ways defines itself by the resistance to and the reforming of the generations that come before it. And it's this natural tension of and the generation before that did that with the generation before them and and, and that generation before them and so on and and so forth until uh the dawn of time i suppose and um that's a metaphor that's really stuck with me uh lately and um i've come to think about it recently as um well originally i i described it like an onion and each layer is peeled off and and while i like that it's like, we can do better than an onion <laughs> for a metaphor. Um, so let me try this one out. Um, I've come to see it like waves uh, in the ocean. And, and so much of our identity is thinking about the wave that's in front of us and the wave that's behind us and the wave that's a few in front of that one and so on. And I think part of the experience of, of growing and maturing in realizing your own place is to is to see the wave that is three waves in front of you crash onto the beach uh, and and dissipate, and then you see the wave that's two and then one, and then you realize uh, next is my turn, uh, perhaps to to land on the beach. Um, but if you never look behind you and realize the rhythm and the continuity of the waves that are to come, um, you miss part of the narrative story uh, of this natural cycle of crashing on the beach, um, but then that being reborn behind you. Mm -hmm. uh, and Roar has talked a lot about this, this going down to come up. That's the whole uh, kind of part of the narrative theme of the book. And this week uh, weekend has been bittersweet for me because um, my grandmother's made the decision to stop fighting her leukemia. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, we're going on hospice and it's a matter of time now. Sorry, Miles. And uh, so we got a chance to gather at my grandparents' house uh, yesterday and celebrate Easter with them, if you will, and just have a time to be with my grandmother. Um, and, you know, she held my daughters on her lap and she held my nephew. And there was this moment, again, of looking what was my identity, uh, was being a, a grandson of my grandparents. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then now what has become my identity, which is becoming this father to these daughters. And it, it reminded me of this cycle of renewal. Mm -hmm. And it's within that, that I, I see the resurrection in, in mm -hmm. Christ today. Wow. Thank you, Miles. So definitely when Jen was talking, like what young people see for the first time, like we can't anymore. Like we've mm -hmm. gotten used to what a sunrise looks like. And every once in a while it may like get us, but for them, all sorts of things are new. It's, you know, the, the first time hearing a song, the first time seeing something in nature they've never seen before, the first time, you know, experiencing these things that we sort of take for granted and that ability to you know, at least view them viewing it for the first time to me is, is sort of that kind of resurrection yeah. of being able to at least grasp onto the memory of that, you know, doing that for the first time or that being new or interesting. Um, and when Miles was talking about sort of the generational sort of passing of the torch and fading away of one generation leading to the next and some of that sort of rebellion or, you know, assessing the previous generation's choices often very cynically and making new choices that we think are going to be better like mm -hmm. it just made me think that 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 feels sort of recent that we can do that and what i mean is like there were times in the past that humans didn't have the privilege to lash out against the previous generation it was about survival it was small communities like we now have the sort of comfort and privilege, at least in this part of the world, in this strata of sort of, you know, socioeconomic safety and whatever to ask those questions where in the past, like 
you didn't do what the previous generation did, you probably didn't survive. Mm. Um, and so it, it just sort of struck in me that we're very privileged to be able to have a moment to look around and not just for a beast that will eat us, but like to assess the community that we're in, the mm. place we are in history. Like we have a written history. We know what happened in the past where mm. most of history that that wasn't the case. Mm. Um, so just the ability for us to make change seems new, yeah. I guess. Wow. Thank you for that perspective, Lee. Okay, but um, for me, part of it, and you know, I want to bring up Ukraine, obviously, um, but the resilience that we keep seeing among people, I was listening to or reading uh, an interview with a president of a seminary in um, Kiev, um, and he was talking about it's really amazing when people refuge or in internally displaced people are coming through and we're putting them up or taking care of them he says you don't hear anyone curse god so you you said and we're talking we're dealing with all kinds of internally displaced people not particularly religious people but just anybody that comes through said no one is cursing god no one is um blaming god for anything uh when you do hear his name mentioned, it's thank God that we were able to make it this far or that this has happened, you know. So it's rather interesting to see that phenomenon where you would expect the other would be mm. said. Um, and it's the idea you see a, a resurrection of community taking place. Mm. Um, when 2014 hit, the those in the East that fled to the rest of Ukraine, they were kind of looked on with a little bit of suspicion. You know, it's all that's happening in the East, who cares? Mm. And, you know, what do you want uh, here? Uh, but that's not the case now. Yeah. Now it's a communal, what appears to be a communal resurrection. That's one thing. Now I'm going to mm. go the opposite way or in a totally different way, uh, more along where you were starting with. Um, Terry was gone this weekend. Um, she said that was a good thing for her. She got to see her sister. I said it was a good thing. She was gone this week. I was by myself, you know, it was a fun, you know. No, not really. Um, but what did she do? She went to all of these gardening centers. But was that five hundred dollars worth of stuff you got? Yes. Oh, it was more. It was more. She comes in in the CRV and says, Hey girl, help me get this stuff out. I opened the back of the CRV. And I mean, there was nothing but color filling mm -hmm. the entire car. You know, immediately all of my allergies hit me, you know, knocked me to the floor. Uh, it was just amazing to see that. <laughs> so, with that, I'm going to pass it to Terry because I think she wants to say more about that. Yeah. I assumed you were going to say when she came back, it was resurrection. You like had your life back. <laughs> well, <and, laughs> y'all know I'm a gardener and I love to garden and I hope I can, I can express about resurrection for me is, um, is that those things that you plant and um, some of them, I'm going to give you all a lesson in gardening. Some of them are called perennials and some of them will stay green throughout the year. And some of them are called deciduous which means that they're going, peonies are going to die back. They're going to come back the next year. And so I have to remind myself to wait for resurrection to occur mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. the spring comes, because the winter is going to have either one, you know, made things die back or two, kill them. Some things will get killed because of a, if it gets cold enough here. And so to remind myself to wait for resurrection, hmm. because if I start too early to plant, I'm probably going to have dug up something I've already planted um, and I already put something there. So I have to wait until everything comes back in the spring to see where it is, where I planted it last year 
and where it's going to come up before I put something else out. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's resurrection. Mm -hmm. Um, To me, God is so alive and well in my garden that that is where I want to be and it's it's funny because those deciduous things that die back and then you just think your yard looks horrible in the winter time <laughs> because you planted things that that die back but you know that they're going to come back mm. and that to me is just that's resurrection for me every spring when when things start blooming and coming back that's my favorite time of the year wow thank you you shared on a level that uh, I could not, as a, as not not being a gardener. So, um, thank you. We got Ben over here. We got, we got another Daryl. I did have one more thing yeah. with that, you know, and then I'll shut up forever. Uh, that's a lie. I don't believe that. I, I, I won't. I won't. <laughs> um, the very fact that we gather here today for Resurrection Sunday. Mm-hmm. The very fact that people all over the world gather for resurrection, as bad as it gets, Mm. people keep telling the story. And as bad as it gets, we keep doing the same thing every year, gather together, tell the story, break the bread. And I think that in and of itself is an amazing testimony. Mm. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, Aiden, our middle child, texted us this just recently, like in the last few minutes. Uh, hey, I can't find my Easter basket. Did y'all hide it really well? <laughs> uh, who lives in College Station? Eggs, you hide Easter baskets. Yeah, it's kind of a tradition. We would we we they'd have to go and find their Easter baskets. <laughs> Uh, so I read that to say he's a very funny kid, but, uh, like my, my kids are just beautiful people. Mm. It's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'm just deeply grateful for mm. them, uh, and having, uh, Emma's friends here, like the, just good, good people surrounded by good people. Uh, second thing, uh, and I'm just, I'm a disaster. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Jen and I celebrate 25 years next month. Wow. And the, yeah. Hey, and, yeah. Like um, anyone staying married for any amount of time is a miracle. Like it really is. It's just so hard. Mm. Um, and I just couldn't be more grateful. Like we really delight in one another. Mm. And given all the trauma we've been through, like it's, it, yeah. it is just a sign of resurrection for yeah. me. And then third, as you've already said, this place and the way that it's um, saved Jen's faith and my own, um, uh, the way in which with confidence um, we could tell our queer friends, like, this is a community for you. Mm. Like it just, um, it's just delightful for me. Yeah. So. Thank you, man. Amen. So this will be adding sort of a sort of cynical spin on some of these things. So (laughs) apologies in advance. It's all right. It's all right. You know, John was mentioning the the refugees and never cursing God. And the sort of cynical take on this is that's a little bit of survivorship bias. Um, These are people who have been literally saved. That represents a small tip of the iceberg of the number of people who aren't. So they may be cursing God or their situation and don't get out. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's not to say that there isn't, you know, thankfulness to be had and sort of salvation to be had, but there's a lot of people not experiencing that. Yeah. To and may have anger at those that get out and have anger at God for why not me and anger at the people that are doing the work trying to get people out that why not me or my family or whatever. So, like, just I guess I'm saying this to say we have to sort of be careful in, you know, the selection of 
like all oh, these people all are doing great then they're happy about that and it's like yeah well they have friends family others that didn't get out and may not have like that same perspective yeah 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 thank you lee we hold the tension Uh, we'll hear the good news. Christ is risen. Happy Easter, beloved. <laughs>